Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Amza Ali. I'm the chief medical officer for Avicana. Avicana, as you know from this morning's session, uh, is a, a biotechnology company based in Toronto, Canada. And its focus is solely in the medical and scientific space with absolutely no recreational exposure. And that has been the philosophy of the company from its inception, and that has continued to, to, to evolve as we recognize the industry changing around us. So what I want to do this afternoon in the last session of this uh, uh, symposium is to speak on the use of natural cannabinoids in the management of neurological disorders, and also uh, to touch on the issue of chronic pain, but in particular, chronic neuropathic pain an entity which causes major problems, as we all know, around the world with huge morbidity and even mortality. So I'm going to, uh, this is the outline of my talk, which is really going to look at the history of cannabinoids in medicine over the, the, the years, and to focus uh, our discussion around four principal areas as listed. So what is the history of uh, the use of cannabis as medicines? Well, cannabis as a plant was first uh, discovered and used for rope uh, in China uh, 12,000 years, uh, well, 14,000 years ago. And then later on uh, in China and India and Sumeria, it actually uh, began having its applications in a wide variety of, of medical conditions. Then it went through a phase of use in the Middle East and uh, around the year 1200, its use was described as an anti-epileptic drug uh, in, in the Middle East. But then it went through a phase of absolutely no, uh, no uh, medical applications. And this uh, was, was brought to an interesting end, if you like, by an Irish physician by the name of William O'Shaughnessy, who decided to take his leave of absence from Ireland and to tour Asia and in particular India to discover what agents were being used to treat a number of different conditions. He actually went with the intention of looking uh, for ways to treat diarrheal illnesses and came back with uh, a vial of a tincture of cannabis which he expected to use to treat a patient with, with diarrhea. But in fact, he was presented with a young child, a 40-day-old child, who was having serial seizures that weren't stopping, hundreds of seizures a day, totally unconscious, unable to function, and highly likely to die. And so he decided to treat that patient with this spiritus tincture, as it was described. And he uh, utilized the classic start low, go slow, titration that we advise for many people now uh, with cannabinoids. And he was actually able to stop this child's uh, malignant see, uh, state of status epilepticus. And several months later, he was happy to note, and this article was published, that the child is now in the enjoyment of robust health and has regained her natural plump and happy appearance. So this is the first description in, in Western literature of cannabinoids being used to treat seizures. But I should describe to you what is epilepsy. Epilepsy is an electrical disorder of the brain in which the electrical abnormalities may start in one part of the brain, i.e. their focal, or they may be generalized, occurring throughout the brain. It is a very common disorder. In fact, it is the commonest primary neuropsychiatric disorder behind depression. And what's interesting about epilepsy is that nearly half of patients with epilepsy also suffer from depression. And the incidence of epilepsy is, 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 is quite high. The key point is this. With all of the available medications that we have, and we have many, especially in the last 20 or 30 years, there has been an absolute avalanche in the number of new anti-epileptic drugs. But still, 30 percent of our patients with epilepsy remain poorly responsive or not at all responsive to all available medical treatments. Some of these patients may benefit from surgery, but there remains a hard core of 25 percent of patients 
who will never find benefit from any therapeutic modality. And if you take, this, uh, if you take a look beyond the shores of developed countries, the actual uh, number of patients with intractable epilepsy is the other way around. It's 75%. So we are talking about a disorder that creates enormous uh, morbidity and mortality. Why then uh, are we interested in cannabis as a drug? Well, over the years, and in particular since the drug became illegal uh, in North America and many other parts of the world, many patients have described using uh, cannabis in various forms to treat their epilepsy, and many have reported benefit. This led to us trying to study better the receptor system for, can for cannabinoids. And as we all know, two receptors have been identified, CB1, which is a target for THC, and CB2, which is not a target for THC, and not indeed a target for CBD, as was once thought. As you know, THC and CBD are the two primary cannabinoids that exist, but there are over 100 cannabinoids in the cannabis plant, as well as other agents in particular, terpenes, some of which have anti-inflammatory and anti-epileptic activity, as well as flavonoids as well, which also have health benefits. Now, that has led people to try to study the receptors that cannabis uh, uh, ad attacks or, 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 or focuses on, and there are many others as listed here. The key point is this. Seizures are brought under control by cannabis through multiple receptor sites. And quite probably, especially if we're speaking about the whole plant extract, as was alluded to this morning by some of the uh, panel pre and presenters, probably through multiple other agents than CBD. Indeed, if you compare uh, isolates to whole plant extracts, you do find some interesting observations in that um, in, so in many studies, more patients treated with CBD-rich extracts, i.e. full-spectrum uh, uh, products, have um, better seizure control than those without. However, scientifically, if you take it to the threshold of a 50% reduction in seizures or more, uh, they more or less look similar. But the key point is there is a reduction in, in seizures in patients with all types of epilepsy. And I'm going to talk about that a little more as we go further. Indeed, if you look at all of the available uh, literature leading up to more or less now, you see a, a couple of things. You see that some studies use purely CBD or CBD-rich ex, uh, extracts. Some use THC isolates, although we know based on looking at the preparations that were used, they're really not pure THC uh, uh, products, and some use a combination of CBD and THC. But what you see throughout is a problem that plagues research in this field. These studies are underpowered. Look at the number of participants in these studies. These studies are extremely small, and although some of them profess to be randomized and double-blinded and placebo-controlled as you'd like them to be, they are grossly underpowered, and therefore the data is, is suspect. Indeed, many of the studies that have been done have been open-label, and we know the problems with open-label studies. Now, how commonly uh, is medical cannabis used? A good study was done two years ago in Australia, which actually demonstrated that in people with epilepsy, 13 to 15% of people were or are using cannabis in addition to their standard medications. And the vast majority, as you see here, 90% of adults and 71% of, of parents of children, reported a reduction in seizure frequency. Now, what were the reasons for these people wanting to try these drugs? As you can see, some of them were not responding to their, to their treatments. And many of them who were responding to their treatments wanted to try to reduce the doses of those drugs because of the unfavorable side effects of their standard drugs. And we see this quite commonly in clinical practice, where patients will become seizure-controlled 
and you think that their quality of life is going to improve. But we all know that if you're over sedated and drugged, how can you function? And one of the reasons people try cannabinoids secretly out there is to try to reduce the amount of, of medication, standard medication that they're taking. One interesting and consistent predictor of the likelihood of people trying cannabinoids uh, was the number of drugs, they, standard drugs they tried before, and also the number of drugs they were taking. In, in other words, if they were taking two or more drugs, they were highly likely to also want to try cannabinoids on their own. And if they were, had tried six drugs serially, then they too as well. So, the issue of cannabinoids for epilepsy, well, it's complex. We have multiple compounds in the whole plant extracts working on a number of different receptors, as I've shown you. Indeed, with CBD, as I've shown you, there are five potentially different receptors uh, that CBD may be operating through. Some of these uh, cannabinoid preparations have interactions between themselves. Some of these are synergistic, uh, as, as it was described earlier in the so-called entourage effect. Um, sometimes there are synergies between the APIs that are being used as standard drugs for, for the neurological condition and the cannabinoids that are being introduced. But which cannabinoids are having synergies, uh, it's difficult to tell, especially when you're using a full-spectrum uh, agent. And this too is complicated by the fact that there is non-standard manufacturing and indeed Epilepsy itself is enormously heterogeneous. There are many, many different types of epilepsy and many, many different causes of epilepsy. And to complicate it all, you ha to do clinical trials in this space, you deal with the, p the powerful placebo effect that cannabis has out there. People want it to work. They like it because it's natural, and so they, they're drawn to it. And because of all of these things, they expect a lot from it. The best evidence for this was when they looked at the success rate of patients in Colorado, of those people who were in Colorado receiving treatments for epilepsy and those who came to Colorado, who had to leave their uh, states to come to Colorado. Those patients uh, had a much better response rate, even though when matched by age, sex, epilepsy type and every other criterion, they were in fact identical. So the placebo effect is very, very powerful. And so, to study this, the best way to study this is to, to do uh, randomized controlled studies that are placebo con controlled and double blinded using a single isolate. That is not to diminish the fact that a whole plant extracts clearly have the potential to treat. But for us to understand the individual components of this complex plant, you need to study them in isolation. And this was done in a seminal paper in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine by Helen Cross and Oren Davinsky, studying Dravet syndrome, which is a single gene disorder uh, due to a sodi sodium channel mutation. And uh, it is attractive in, in that sense, therefore, because it's a single gene disorder. And guess what? It worked. It worked really well. As this, this slide shows, with about 40% reduction uh, in seizures in, in patients with Lennox Gasto and with, with Dravet syndrome. And even in Lennox Gasto, which itself is a heterogeneous childhood epilepsy syndrome. But, but the but can it, CBD has absolutely nothing to do with the pathology of Drave. The pathology of Drave is a sodium channel disorder, and there's no evidence that CBD works on, 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 this, on the sodium channel. So how it's working, clearly it's working through other mechanisms, but that it works is self-evident. So we continue to need to study this. I'm going to leave epilepsy and turn now to the, the last three remaining conditions. One. The first one is multiple sclerosis. All of you, I'm sure, are aware that MS, many patients with MS have been using cannabinoids to treat it. This is a 34-year-old uh, woman who uh, developed optic neuritis in one eye, <coughs> inflammation that is, and then in the other eye, and then, then developed other sy neurological syndromes uh, leading to a diagnosis of uh, multiple sclerosis. When given beta interferon, one of the standard agents to treat, MS, uh, it reduced her relapse frequency, but she was unable to tolerate it. And then she started to de develop severe dystonia and shoulder pain that was 
unresponsive to all the antispasticity agents and pain medications. So in desperation, she decided one night to smoke cannabis. And she was amazed at the reduction in her stiffness and pain. And now, after many years, she continues to smoke uh, uh, cannabis while still also using her standard medications and alternative agents uh, to reduce her pain. Now, we don't advocate uh, that people smoke cannabis because we know uh, smoked uh, cannabis has a number of toxins in it and also can lead to bronchial problems and other problems. Uh, Avicana is not using anything inhaled, uh, certainly nothing in the smoked uh, space. But this is just one example of a product that is inhaled, a whole plant extract that has produced marked benefit in, in my patient. Some studies have already been done, again, plagued by small numbers and being underpowered. But what this slide shows is that when cannabis is exhibited, there was a marked reduction in, in spasticity uh, scales. And, and these were placebo-controlled trials. It also helps other symptoms, such as uh, bladder symptoms and also uh, pain, pain in general, uh, excluding neuropathic pain. Now, one of the things I want to say about spasticity is what happens in, in the clinical uh, um, scenario. Some patients will report that their subjective re spasticity is reduced. But other patients, will, when you examine them, well, the same patient, if you examine them, you'll find that there's no change. They don't actually have objective reductions in spasticity, but their subjective change is so significant, they want to continue to use the, the, the cannabinoid. Yet others, too, also have a reduction in objective scales. So there may be a subjective improvement, but there may also be an objective improvement in spasticity in MS. And in the case of nabiximol, which is a combination of THC and CBD, there may also be bladder improvement, uh, something that is, again, uh, relevant to, uh, to us all and to the previous uh, speaker. There are natural agents which can help with bladder symptoms. Now, I want to turn to Parkinson's disease, another condition which is extremely common. In fact, it is becoming the commonest neurodegenerative condition in the world as our population ages. And we need to take close, uh, pay close attention to this condition because we will all need to be developing uh, treatments uh, for it. And many patients with Parkinson's have reported uh, some amount of benefit, usually in terms of a reduction in, in anxiety or some reduction in motor symptoms. Now, Parkinson's is a condition that is characterized by four principal symptoms. Tremor, rigidity, slowness, and a tendency to fall, especially when you turn. This disease greatly reduces your quality of life. And the side effects of the principal treatment, uh, levodopa, are significant. In particular, the development of what are called dyskinesias, abnormal movements that can plague a patient's life and greatly disturb their quality of life to the degree where some patients will actually stop their treatments and just accept the, spa, the, the rigidity of the disease itself. Now, what's the evidence for uh, uh, cannabinoids in Parkinson's? The literature is actually very conflicting, but we believe at Avicana that there may be benefit in reducing the dyskinesias of levodopa and also for us to treat many of the quality of life parameters such as sleep and the pain associated with rigidity and some of the other neuropsychiatric uh, problems that patients have. And we are presently about to start a study at, at the University of Toronto uh, examining uh, these issues in particular. One of the problems again in Parkinson's disease is the issue of heterogeneity. The same issue of clinical heterogeneity that plagues research in epilepsy is also a factor in Parkinson's disease. Dyskinesia has many causes, uh, many mechanisms, and there are many different types of preparations that we then have to try to match and work out which might be best. In particular, ratios of THC to CBD. Uh, what we need throughout the area of cannabis research and cannabinoid research is to adequately power our studies. Have large studies, 
big numbers, adequately randomized, placebo-controlled, and double-blinded, that when we generate studies, they are meaningful. And now I'll turn to the last issue, which is that of chronic pain. Chronic pain is pain that you suffer with for at least three months. Pain requires us to think of it as more than just the biological entity of physical aspects of pain. But pain has psychological um, uh, implications, particularly depression and anxiety, and a feeling of futility with chronic pain, and, and a social uh, phenomenon, a social construct that surrounds chronic pain, including isolation and, and, and the whole, uh, the whole uh, evolution and the whole vicious spiral that surrounds someone who has to live with this uh, type of disorder. It affects 13% of patients in the UK, and nearly half of patients, again, just like epilepsy, uh, half of patients with chronic pain suffer from depression. These mental health diagnoses and these emotional difficulties can greatly influence the experience of pain and complicate management and need to be taken into context, into consideration when you treat these patients. A key point is this, the intensity of the pain that you feel doesn't necessarily relate to the intensity of the tissue damage that you have and may be related to all of these factors as listed. In particular, and maybe not what's listed here, your previous experience to treatment of your pain. So if you have a problem in which you get exacerbations of pain and your previous treatments were not successful, you are set up for a worse experience the next time it should come around. That's the normal thing that happens to us as human beings. We live in fear. Pain can be considered into three broad categories. Pain related to tissue injury, nociceptive. Pain that is related to an inappropriate and continuing phenomenon of pain related to damage to the somatosensory nervous system, the system that uh, is responsible for you uh, generating painful symptoms. And finally, the fibromyalgic syndrome in which you become hypersensitive and therefore um, constantly in pain. The WHO analgesic ladder has been used as a method that shows a stepped-up approach to treating chronic pain. But it is really uh, one that focuses on the use of, of opiates in the context of cancer-related pain and is not really appropriate for neuropathic pain. And sometimes when patients with neuropathic pain are given opioids, you end up with a hyperalgesic state, an even worse state where your pain is many times worse than it was uh, before you started the opioids. So clearly patients with neuropathic pain, and by the way, there are about 60 million people globally who live with neuropathic pain, most commonly due to the effects of chronic diabetes. Uh, so clearly there's a role and a need to identify new treatments. So what about cannabinoids for neuropathic chronic pain? I'll tell you about two cases that I've seen. The first is a patient with spinal stenosis who was 69 years old and developed severe radicular pain due to multi-level lumbosacral spondylotic nerve root uh, compressions. This was confirmed by the usual tests. And he proved unresponsive to all medical treatments and physiotherapy, and so ended up having surgery. Unfortunately, as is the case for roughly 50% of people who have back surgery, he did not respond to surgery, and he was thus a surgical failure. And what happens to people like that who've, ex who've used every treatment, including surgery? He became profoundly depressed. And he was started on, on paroxetine, and this too didn't help him. On his own, he turned to, to smoking cannabis and then to making a tea and drinking it and experienced dramatic relief with that and continued this with the advent of available oil tinctures and so on and has continued to be, um, to be uh, uh, well, his pain level is now below 3 out of 10 on a scale of 3 out of 10. He's able to function and this has now been 9 years since this uh, uh, gentleman discovered uh, cannabis in this form. Now, one of the points I want to make about cannabis, though, is cannabis uh, interacts uh, with many other drugs. And one of the ways it does it is by actually inhibiting liver enzymes. And when it inhibits liver enzymes, it actually sends up 
the, the dose of many other drugs that may, may be on board that, uh, that also utilize that enzyme system. And one of those drugs is paroxetine. And you would find that if a patient smokes uh, cannabis or uses cannabis, and those enzymes are turned off, the paroxetine levels may rise. And so therefore, part of the benefit uh, that patients may be seeing may actually theoretically be because the dose of their paroxetine was pushed up. But I can tell you, this patient went up to the highest dose of paroxetine and found no value before coming back down to a lower level. That too applies in epilepsy. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a drug called clobazam that is used to treat uh, many of those children who have Dravet syndrome. And what we found is that sometimes the level of clobazam went up 16-fold. And people can't be sure at this point in time whether some of the effect of cannabis is in partly because it's been reducing the metabolism of, of, of clobazam. But all of these require further studies to be done, and that is what is being done. Now, the, la the last patient I'll tell you about is a 58-year-old man with a 20-year history of diabetes who basically developed diabetic uh, painful neuropathy. And he was tried on gabapentin, which is the drug that most people use and view as, as a gold standard for treating neuropathic pain, to a maximum dose of, of 2,400 milligrams uh, per day. But this had no effect on his uh, pain and indeed only produced drowsiness. On his own again, he smoked cannabis, and it worked to the degree that he actually tapered off his, his gabapentin and continued to smoke uh, cannabis with uh, perfect benefit. Now, these are, I'm giving you examples of patients who have smoked, uh, specifically because I just want to show you the early experience that, uh, with, with cannabinoids. But we know we have to do more than tell everyone to smoke. Now, this problem of neuropathic pain has led in the UK to opioid prescri prescribing, as I've said, where uh, the number of prescriptions for opiates has quadrupled or more over the, the last several years. And so clearly the number of patients out there who are in need of treatment is rising. When we've looked at the systematic reviews of cannabinoids for pain, there may be benefits, as I've shown you, for using inhaled uh, medicinal forms, inhaled cannabis, but as I've also said to you, the side effects in the long term are going to outweigh the benefit. There may be benefits in treating acute pain, most of all post-operative pain where there's an element of inflammation, as Mark Weir has described. But uh, combinations of THC and CBD, like as in, uh, in the oral mucosal sprays, seem to have uh, more efficacy and less side effects. Indeed, some THC seems necessary. In fact, some studies have used only THC, either in a synthetic form or in a, in a natural form. But, but we believe to modulate the effect of THC, some CBD is necessary because there is a modulating effect of the psychoactive properties of THC when it is used in conjunction with CBD. But we are yet to find and determine what that optimal ratio is. That optimal ratio may differ in epilepsy, versus pain, versus anxiety, and other indications. And that's where, again, the research is needed. We believe, too, that, that, that cannabinoids may be more useful for chronic pain than acute pain. Again, we need to keep in mind that when you treat a patient with pain in particular, you must set specific predefined goals that must include not only improving the patient's pain score, but remembering that they need to be functional and also, too, that we need to keep in mind their quality of life, which is not only related to the degree of pain. Final considerations. Some patients report feeling better when using cannabis in one form or another. But the question is, how much of this is a placebo effect? There is a placebo effect. If you give a patient something and you tell them it's going to work, their expectations of benefits can cause the release of our natural endorphins and make us feel better. But one of the things about the placebo effect is it's not sustained in the long term. And so if you do studies that have uh, a high placebo effect using an agent that has a high placebo effect, you need to do long-term studies. And you also need to be creative. You may need to consider other ways of analyzing and identifying the placebo effect, in including using machine learning and other forms of artificial intelligence. I end really with this 
slide. The problems with cannabinoid research so far have been that they, these have been unblinded studies of low power, short duration, high placebo, placebo effect, too few done with, as randomized controlled studies. You can't compare apples to oranges. Whole plant extracts are not the same as isolates. And the delivery systems influence the pharmacokinetic characteristics. Pain itself, like epilepsy and many other conditions, is a heterogeneous condition. And we need to remember that, that if we're doing studies, we need to have a pure population of patients so that we can draw strong and confident conclusions about that subpopulation only. And remember, many people are using uh, cannabinoids now in one form or another, and therefore finding naive patients may actually sometimes be quite difficult. And so I believe cannabinoids can, and there's an un unmet need that we need to address, and we're trying to do that at our company uh, through cannabinoid studies. Thank you.